Get the uh, formal YouTube intro out of the way. Hey everyone, Anthony Fantano here, Internet's Busiest Music Nerd. Hope you're doing well. And it's time for an interview. Today we are having a discussion with the legendary electronic music producer, multi-instrumentalist, uh, fresh off the announcement of the 25th anniversary of his debut full-length record, Feed Me Weird Things. We have Square Pusher, a.k.a. Mr. Tom Jenkinson. How you doing, man? Good, thanks. How you doing? Good, good. Um, right off the bat, I want to... Thanks say sorry for illegally downloading this record when I was in college. Um, just grabbed it off soul seek after I think I had bought a CD copy of hard normal daddy and, and really just kind of the rabbit hole just went down from there. Uh, well, I mean, my early days of, uh, trying to build up a collection of music was taping from the radio. So it's all in the same spirit, you know, cassettes with a forerunner of all that stuff. And so I really would be a hypocrite. If I, if I thought that was actually a bad thing to have done, so no worries. Yeah, that was, uh, I, I know we had a bit of a rash of this over here in the U.S., but was there as much of uh, back then in the U.K., like uh, this industry concern of things like home taping, killing music, and sort of like being a danger to music sales? I, I know on a lot of records over here, we used to have a sticker with like a cassette and crossbones on it. Yeah, it was like this kind of, this, the, like the skull was the cassette, right? <laughs> The eyes of the skull. <laughs> it's take. I mean, it's, that is a brilliant bit of design. Brilliant, I mean, brilliant I love but that. so dramatic. Oh yeah, I mean, it's kind of melodramatic. Absolutely, it's it's a bit of a nuanced argument. And uh, but in terms of the terms of the UK, I mean, I think the height of that was around the turn of the the decade, right, the start of the eighties. I mean, I've got records. Certainly, I can I can think of a few right now where that logo is actually stamped on the back. So it's part of the art. Wow. Um, but by the time I was buying records, so that was more like the late eighties, I think it had fizzled out. They'd either given up or realized actually this particular panic isn't actually really worth having, hmm. you know, probably in certain ways. I mean, certainly in terms of me and no doubt countless other musicians of my generation. I mean, it was nurturing music, you know, music of the future, of course. Hmm. But nonetheless, you know, I mean, it enabled me to have a library of stuff. I mean, I cannot think of a bad thing about it. Well, I, I, guess, I guess I just sort of involved myself in the latest reiteration of that. Um, so uh, now that we're kind of already in the past, uh, let's start with, I guess, uh, kind of your early years producing electronic music. I mean, I know that, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a lot of your foundation musically begins at the base and before you started producing music as a square pusher, you know, or under any alias, um, you know, you'd been in yeah. a lot of bands, done a lot of gigs, but, um, yeah. you know, what was kind of like that, uh, that inspirational point that kind of transitioned you over into, you know, techno and acid house and kind of got you started in that field. So I remember being at a party in 1990, it was a house party. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there was a sort of a distant friend who was playing some records. And he's actually the chap who went on to set up Spy Mania record, Records, which is the first label I released uh, Square Pusher music on. And uh, he was a bit of a savant when it came to like underground music coming out of America at the time, but also uh, the, the, the British music that you might say was of a, of a similar order. So he was playing this stuff, and I was, you know, at this point, I, my focus was like jazz, really, mm. you know, and, and music was, it was based on instruments, you know, that was, this was really kind of like a critical time for me, like developing my technique as a, as a, as a bass guitar player. But this piece came on and it was suddenly completely electric, like the, 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 and the thing that I remember most about it is the, is the, is the sort of visual impression that it created because it was so vivid. And not all music gives me this impression of colours, but this particular music, it was, it was like a vivid green and pink. Mm. And I'll never forget that. It's like neon light. So sort of futuristic sounding. It sounded like a kind of transmission from another planet. And that was LFO by LFO. So I had this kind of beautiful kind of ethereal sort of space age sound but also this like kind of enormous sub bass element too 
And I, I think that 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 base element actually that that you you would find in that piece and many others at the time was 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 kind of more of a UK centric approach to to dance music. Mm. But this this was a yeah like a turning point really. At, at that point, I, I realised okay, I have to know more about this stuff. So at that point, in terms of my own music making endeavours, I mean, I was this is still in the times when I was just playing in local bands just whatever venues would have us, you know, across the kind of local counties. Mm. And, and and also I would be playing in bands, whatever I could find, you know, I played in a, around that time, like a progressive rock band. Uh, it was like guys with just loads of keyboards. Like they had so many keyboards. I mean, more keyboards than I've got now, you know, like they're just keyboard, like maniacs. Mm. And, and, you know, I got to know some different stuff with them. I was in a blues, blues kind of rock covers band. Um, I was in a, you know, another group playing rock, sort of like more poppy kind of stuff. So it it, it kind of uh, didn't have any immediate impact on what I was doing in terms of my music making, but it certainly set a, a new process in train. You know, I'd already had experience with electronics and music, you know, with messing out with four tracks with guitar pedals hmm. and then going back further, like my Vic 20 computer where I made drum machine programs, like some of my first recordings using a bass guitar were playing along to big 20 drum machine stuff so it wasn't like electronics were illegal but my attention had drifted away and uh, and then if i pulled it right back in focus yeah now I, in past interviews you've spoken pretty deeply about a lot of those influences that have i guess uh, you know transitioned over you into that more electronic space but um you know i, I guess uh what i'm curious about is like what are some of those first pieces of like equipment that sort of helped you manifest mm. that transition because you know not only are you kind of like yeah. you know making an aesthetic change in your head is like okay you know this is kind of the musical musical direction i want to move in but like you know the mode of playing in a band and playing bass and live instrumentation and creating in mm. that framework as opposed to like composing on a sequence you know an imagined or you know on a screen or something like that is totally different so you know as as an artist and as a creator what was that adjustment like for you at that time and, and kind of adjusting to that and putting your own spin on it so the first thing that I think really could be sort of called a fully fledged part of that development was the Roland SH-101. So this is not like the principal kind of acid machine, but um, I'd heard of it already because I was aware of um, some of the stories surrounding this um, record by 808 State mm -hmm. called New Build. So this was a kind of innovative, quite strange, quite far out record, kind of bleak, kind of machine-like stuff, but but with this incredible kind of throb, real sort of driving, kind of hypnotic sort of dance aspect. And then these crazy sort of bubbling synths. So the 101 was part of that sound. They had, I think I think they had three on there. So I, I saw this thing in a local music shop and uh, asked them to plug it in for me. And I, I, as soon as I started playing with it, I couldn't believe it, it was like, this is it, this is that sound, that kind of brown, the low pass filter with the resonance. You know, I was I was hooked immediately. So, you know, a friend and I clubbed together, got the money, it was a hundred pounds. We bought this thing and, and I was away. So from that point, I was starting to make tunes using the SH-101, layering up uh, loads and loads of stacks of sound mm. from, that, from that instrument. So like starting off like playing a bass line and then with a with a with a kind of a beat as well, say like sort of a, a throbby low sound to kind of make a baseline kind of rhythmic thing, and then putting on percussion, doing using the white noise, and then a melody, and then dubbing over a, like a bass guitar part or two bass parts. And I, I made a lot of stuff like that, kind of really super squidgy sounding, kind of lo-fi cassette based stuff, you know, dubbing between machines, so then a four track. Yeah, you're sort of taking these separate parts point. and like throwing them into a, into a four track onto a tape. This is not four track. What I was doing is, is dubbing between two two track machines. Oh, okay. So basically, yeah. So I would record a tape, say, and then then I'd have a signal on one cassette. Then I would live mix the signal from one cassette machine with the new instrument layer onto the different cassette. Play a recording on the different machine. So this way, I build up, and I was basically bouncing between machines, but adding a new live layer every time I made a new bounce. Mm. So. That was, and then I bought the 707. That was a, that's a, another Roland machine uh, later in that year, and that can sync directly to the 101. 
So it was kind of like this this gradual accumulation. I mean, and that stuff is obviously at the cheaper end of the scale. But it was it was building up like that, and and also there was a lot of borrowing going along. There was a lot of uh, oh mate, can you can you lend me that flash drum machine for a week? You know, I wanted to see what I can do with it. You know, so I end up being this magnet. I mean, it's kind of bad, but. I just had to have it. It's like, oh, can I just use it? And so I was a like, magnet for all the equipment, you know, that my, my friends had. <laughs> but, you know, here we are. Good. And uh, so, yeah, it's just a, a build-up. But, I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I completely see what you're saying. Like, it's a different mindset. That's very true. But straight away, I mean, like, getting into that uh, mode of making music that I just described one of the early kind of thoughts I remember having, and it was very elemental kind of thought. It wasn't like a like I have this vision and it's perfect already, and all I need to do is carry it out. But I was already thinking in those days, like, what would it be like to try to make music that has some of the characteristics of jazz? Mm. Because I was used to the music that was made with that equipment that was more like the stuff that came out of like Chicago in the late eighties, like the acid and the house music as well, you know, all from the US and, and this, you know, amazing, very rich kind of body of music, and which I love. But I also thought, well, what would happen if you tried to interrupt that repetitiveness, which is kind of core to that hypnotic thing that's so wonderful about that music? What, 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 would, it, what would it be like if you, if you take away the repetition or if you, if you try to build in something where things are continually sort of developing, you know, and that there's it's not really about like a theme that you 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 kind of repeat to build up the intensity it's more like you're, you're sort of building intensity through through a narrative mm -hmm. and you're going from a to b and you know that that was not the only thing i was thinking about music but it was it was a strong it was a strong sort of idea that that uh took years in the end to try to actually put into practice yeah but yeah, so so there was a, already in those days, what I'm saying really is that there was a, already a crossover from my experience as an improviser on a, on a conventional instrument uh, to using electronics mm -hmm. and, and trying to basically, which is, you know, still to this day, once it's something I find fascinating is, is this uncanny sweet spot where you don't quite know how things are done. You know, is it live? Is it programmed? And that, that, that it's, actually feeding from both directions yeah i mean uh, uh to go off of a few things that you just said you know I, I think it's kind of significant to to hear that process of getting to where you were creating and what you were creating on because like these days how to make electronic music and various strains of electronic music is so highly publicized and you know like dug deep into on mm -hmm. various forums and places on the internet whereas back in the day you, you were relying on word of mouth of like oh yeah i heard this machine's on this record yeah. i heard this you know or hey yeah. can i borrow that you know there was no forum to go on to be like oh yeah this will make this sound or yeah. there was no Sweetwater demo no. on youtube <laughs> no there was i mean it was an oasis and, and and actually the the peculiar thing is i mean it although the music scene where I grew up was, was, was fairly vibrant. Like there were quite a few good local bands. There were some nice venues, you know, and across the county and beyond, you know, there, there was some good places to play and some, and some good musicians too, you know, who I learned a lot from. But there was really like no interest in electronics. And I was always trying to find people who, who did care about this stuff, who, who, who knew about, you know, not just kind of keyboards in the kind of rock and roll sense, but but like but doing ma machine music, you know, and and doing things that were basically kind of escaping that um, call it what you will, with whether it's a trap or it's an advantage, whether it's a benefit or something that's detrimental. It's 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 so many different things, but it is it's a world unto itself, the world of instrumental technique, and it, I think it is kind of a different paradigm when you're telling a machine to to come and play stuff you know and and there, there just weren't any be any people who knew about it there just simply weren't there was there was the guy in the guitar shop who also had a drum machine for sale mm. and 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 he he knew less than me so it was really yeah it was it was but i think the the benefit because on, on the on the whole i would say that the kids now a whole lot better off. I really do think that. But, 
but I, perhaps a benefit of how it was though in those days is that I had to imagine everything. Mm. And actually everything I not everything I imagined was actually correct. I mean, in terms of the facts. I would I mean this I mean this goes to bass guitar actually as well. You know, I'd, I'd hear people playing bass and go like because I did actually, you know, what I said about the vibrancy of the scene. There were no like real virtuoso bassists. So like no one had to do like slap was just a sort of mystery they eh? do that stuff it's like a kind of loads of notes come from you don't know which hand is doing what so i just, I just made it up mm. and some of the things that you assume when you hear a record you think well that must be how it's done actually turn out to be incorrect but but there's something actually to be cherished in that because you've you've, you've by doing so you've actually discovered a new little zone so so ju and just it, just a detour for a second and clarify like a track like for example deep fried pizza um yeah. at the time that you slapped that solo you were just completely making that up like or just sort of like engineering just from intuition you're you know there, there was no like you know reference point that you were going off of or sort of like advice you were just like this kind of sounds like what should happen so i'm just going to do it well, I mean, so deep fried pizza, I mean, this is by this time I was 21. Mm. So, I mean, this, this phase of, of like just flying blind. I mean, I'm talking about when I was a teenager, got it, got it. Okay. you know, like when I was like early teenage and sort of, you know, hearing this stuff and, 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 it, and it having this kind of mad sort of polyrhythmic thing happening, got it. but, but melodic at the same time, but, but not knowing how it's done and just, just doing this until it started sounding okay. But yeah, I, I suppose, I mean, I, and I, I didn't ever have any guidance. I didn't ever actually ever really meet anyone who told me that it was right or wrong. Mm. But I think by the time I was 21, whether the technique was right or the wrong, right or wrong, it had condensed into something that was sort of steady and at least, you know, I knew how it worked. So I could kind of pull off more or less whatever ideas came into my head. Uh, just to remind you guys, if you scroll down and hit the Q&A tab, you can ask some questions of our guest Square Pusher that we will uh, throw in toward the halfway point of the interview. Um, so to continue to, you know, the inception point and kind of your musical process with arriving to this album, uh, would it be fair to say that kind of the the break be and incorporating that into your work was kind of like an aha moment that got you, you know, to, to the point where Feed Me Weird things could become possible? Because on a lot of those tracks, the way you edit those beats sounds almost like a jazz fusion drum solo you know it sounds like something off of a weather report or a maha vishnu record you know like the, yeah. the way that you're kind of editing those beats and getting them to kind of you know stutter and layer over each other well yeah i mean that's where it ended up absolutely um and, it, and it's all of a piece with this uh initially quite elemental vision i had when i was you know 16 17 just starting out with the with the roland stuff that i just described that you know, trying to see what, whether there could be a jazz form of electronic music, if you like. And um, that's where it ended up. But the the kind of origins of my excitement and, and interest in that way of working using, as you describe it, breakbeats, goes a lot back for, you know, a, a lot further back. So um, around sort of 1991, you know, the, the breakbeat scene was was gathering pace in this country. It was it was still kind of music that would be, you know, typically around 130 to 140 BPM category. And people at that point hadn't really got into the chopping up of breaks. It was more or less like you just get a, a drum break off, a, you know, an old soul record or funk record or whatever, and then just, you know, pitch it up to, yeah, you know, so it's running at like 140 and and uh off it goes you know and probably not quite as strong an impact as the lfo track i described but but hearing this stuff was, was also really like a big influence because suddenly rather than that sort of rather plastic i don't mean plastic in a derogatory sense i i mean um sort of not based in a real uh physical sound making entity yeah, it's like synthetic or plastic rigid. set Precisely, yeah, the synthetic nature of a drum machine. Um, and even when it's sample based, it always sounds synthetic. But, but rather than that, they had beats, you know, and it, and it would, you know, it would be incorporating the kind of ghost notes and the, and the kind of nuance. You know, even if it was repeating, you'd still kind of I'd get a lot from that. And uh, 
and then as time went by people became you know th there was greater sophistication in how that uh, that was being used but so when i by the time i got my hands on a sampler uh, in 1994 you know this was one of the first things i wanted to do with it you know because however sophisticated i'd try to get with the drum machines that that always felt kind of locked in a particular sound world and, and for me that the, the breaks was a way of expanding beyond that and that there's just a particular you know even if it's like you're saying like basically reducing it to granules of sound so like none of the nuance of the original drummer in drumming is there anymore it's all the feel is gone because you've just basically completely uh taken it to pieces and deconstructed it and made something new but 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 the nuance in the in the actual way that the instrument is being used you know the, the, the way the drummer hit the snare the accent you know and then how it sounds when it backs off and oh no and, and of course all the nuance from the mics you know it's just i was just addicted to that sound mm. it's just so exciting i couldn't get enough of it yeah i mean it's uh, you you really like hammered on it i mean especially on a uh, uh i wanted to uh kind of get into some of the uh i guess uh you know tracks later into the interview but i guess to, to sort of detour into it now um if if you could go into for a second, just as we're kind of diving into this uh, incredible record, uh, what went into some of the rhythmic mayhem of um, uh, just to remind myself of the title, Future Gibbon? Oh yeah, because like yeah, Future Gibbon. Like man, the rhythms on that one. You're playing you're like you're executing some of the drums on that so quickly they almost just sound like tones. You know, they're just like they're you know. Well, that's exactly. It. I mean, there's a few. There's a funnily enough, there's a few aspects to this that are worth mentioning. The most kind of trivial aspect to it is that the drum break on that is actually a, uh, a recording of me playing the drums at school. Mm. <laughs> so, and, and it was recorded. So it was recorded on this portable cassette recorder that I borrowed from the music department. Mm. This is one of the things I used to do, like early tracks, as well as this process, you know, this process of dubbing between decks. Mm. I used to um, make a, a recording of drums at school. So I just play like a beat for four minutes, you know, knock out like a kind of a, a rhythm and try and put a chorus and a verse and some variation and then end it. Uh, and it, you know, it would always sound really rough, of course, because I'm just recording on this tiny recorder with with this mic that's always really designed to do is catch a voice, not, not full fidelity recording. So um, I had this tape and I, I found it when I was, making that tune i thought oh, i'm going to use that i'm going to make a break beat out of my own bits of drumming from when i was you know 16 or whatever so so that's the break um the actual kind of impetus behind the programming came somewhat from um uh in a roundabout way from uh, my first meeting with richard james so uh when i say meeting like the first kind of organized hookup mm -hmm because uh, we actually met um, more or less as the sleeve notes on uh, Feed Me Weird Things Recount at a, a pub uh, called the George Roby. And that's in an area called Finsbury Park in North London. It's actually no longer there. The, 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 it was converted into a horrible nightclub and then it was demolished. So it was, it was kind of a sad story because it was a great, it was a great pub and uh, it had this kind of very specific character, great, like a lot of London venues, I suppose, at the time, I remember them, remember them quite fondly. You'd have this, you know, half of the, the pub would be a bar. And then um, the back room would be this kind of big space that would be painted black, big ground stack PA, you know, beer glasses shaking above the bar when the bass gets loud, you know, this kind of fun environment to, to make and hear music. So that was the first Square Pusher gig. And uh, Richard happened to be there. So we got chatting after my show uh, and arranged this hookup. So he came over to my house and um, he, he kindly brought a copy of a record he just made called um, Hangable Auto Bulb. And, uh, you know, like it, it sometimes has been the way with Richard, you know, he brings out a new record and suddenly there's, you know, there's a kind of new development in electronic music. So, and this, this was a kind of a, they're kind of understated in, in in melodic terms, but but rhythmically it was pretty thrilling. So so some of the impetus and excitement in in the track you're referring to is is coming from inspiration of that of that record. Mm. And uh, 
So, but the, the tones thing, I mean, that's also very salient because it, it was around this sort of time that I began to, and not, of course, not just me, but um, began to realize that actually, if you make the, the, uh, the intervals of time in between drum hits uh, so short, the, the, the actual pattern can then begin to have a pitch. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it, I found it really enthralling how you could move from the world of rhythm to pitch because in a sort of, in a kind of traditional architecture of music, you know, you have areas like harmony, pitch, melody, rhythm, timbre, style, you know, and, and you know, these these are all open to question. You know, these are all things that are kind of contingent and sort of somewhat kind of provisional, I think. But but they have their force and, and they exist, I think, in, 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 in the musical mind with, with, with some kind of degree of resilience. Mm -hmm. And so it was interesting for me to sort of see this, this link and pathway between rhythm and pitch. Mm -hmm. And actually it led into quite naturally a form of synthesis called granular synthesis, which is basically that. It's basically using tiny fragments of sound to assemble bigger sound picture. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for going into that. Um, I had no idea about that breakbeat. That's incredible. Um, uh, to uh, reference back to uh, what you were just saying about Richard, a.k.a. AFX Twin, who did the uh, uh, liner notes for the record when it was orig originally released on a, you know, Reflex. Uh, is, is there yeah. anything else in regards to um, the reissue of this LP that, you know, sort of adds to, I guess, the history or the lore of the album? Like, are there any additions with this reissue that are kind of, you know, maybe giving fans a deeper dive into into this era? So, uh, yeah, the reissue um, in the LP, for example, it contains a 16-page uh, booklet, which is 12-inch square, so it's a kind of quite a nice big size. Um, there's lots of photographs from my private archive they're not press shots because they're all from days be uh, before i had a career um bar a couple there's a couple of ones that like for example there's one from an enemy gig review mm. like a really early show review i had uh but most of them are just basically photographs that were just taken by friends at parties you know messing about got it um and uh so yeah so but sorry yeah there's also like gig uh posters and flyers uh but, but the main thing i think to answer your question is is um that there is reasonably extensive sleeve notes that i wrote myself and uh it just gives a sort of a track by track breakdown and then a broad history and an overview of the times it's uh um some of it i suppose will be information that not everyone is that interested in the more technical stuff uh I guess it, I, I've tried to drift between anecdotal and technical because, you know, that's that's what I have from the time. You know, that's there was a life, but then there was also, you know, the, the kind of involved activity that produced the music. It all, all felt salient to put in. Now, it's the first time I've done sleep notes for a record, but it, it you know, feels like opening up in a way, but in a, in a feels positive. Mm -hmm. Uh, through that process of opening up and revisiting this LP and kind of preparing it for, you know, this reissue, um, does it give you any thoughts or pause on the fact that at this point it's it's pretty much perceived as a classic? I mean, as a music fan yourself, do you uh, agree with the album kind of having attained that status? I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't back out of this kind of question through cowardice or, or just being obstinate. I really don't think my perspective is, it's so tied up <laughs> with my own life and my own experience, mm. you know, that it's, I think by that nature, I just don't know how much relevance it has to the public. Mm. And in any case, I've got no desire to tell the public what to think about this. You know, they have to go and listen to it and make their own minds up. I mean, look, it, it, it on a on a on a very simplistic level, it helps me if if uh, you know it's considered to be that because it helps me keep going. Mm. You know, if people go and buy it, then it supports the app, supports the artist, and then the, the, you know that's kind of quite important. Mm. 
but in terms of the reputation i mean i i just don't get involved with that stuff i don't read the hype i don't get involved in this is better than that and this is somehow relevant this perhaps is and you know for me if something ends up on a record at some point i have to have felt passion about it you know that might seem funny to some people if they don't like a particular record or they don't see it as somehow part of my style or relevant because my career has jumped around you know there's there's no two ways about it it's been pretty eclectic but it's just the music that felt relevant to me at that time and i was passionate about it and that was part of the criteria of what made it get released. Mm. So it's the same as all of that. Actually, the only thing I would say is that Richard compiled it. Mm. That's that's the major difference between that record and every other record I've made is that Aphex actually put the track list together. Mm. Would you say though that uh, you know your, your time since having released the record has at least in a way, you know, with distance giving you a slight outside perspective on it or, you know, are you so like kind of deeply entwined and and the creative process of it feels like so, you know, intense and, and fresh in your memory that uh, it, it's just too personal. It's, it's a peculiar thing because I don't know if it's also to do with the how strange the last year has been, but it, when I look at it, it just feels like time has collapsed in a way. Like at, at, at the same time, I see it as like it was yesterday and also as events that were impossibly distant. Mm. You know, and this is why I say it, it, it's very hard for me to have a, a a viewpoint on it that I can boil down for you into kind of like a, kind of what might approximate like a kind of critical view. You know, it, it. I know. I think I'm temperamentally not disposed to look backwards. You know, that, that I obviously had to do what I needed to do to supervise the reissue, but there's not that much of a kick for me looking backwards. Mm. You know, it feels like a feels like a prison you know, spending too much time there. Well, having said that, in, in numerous contexts, I believe that you've kind of <clears throat> spoken to your music having this quality of like an ongoing conversation or argument between the electronics and the acoustics, you know, kind of like the, the elements that are more rigid mm. and the elements that are more kind of fluid and live. Uh, do you feel like in your music today, is that argument still going on? And if it is, like what parts of that argument are, <laughs> I guess, still being resolved? Yeah, that's a really good question yeah well yeah the argument will ne i don't think it really by its nature can be resolved mm. um what what tends to be the the pattern is that i will get pushed one way say like a i don't know just to, to pull something out of thin air uh the album Hello Everything. Um, came after Ultra Visitor. Mm. And during Ultra Visitor, I think this was it, it the, as it were, the intensity um, of my work with the electronic side. And by this time it was also incorporating computer programming as well as as uh, uh, as ways of generating some of the sound sources. Uh, but not only that, like computer-based editing. So there were there were quite a lot of developments that happened, um, you know, in quite quite quick succession from um, 2002 onwards. Really, it, it was like a lot of my music-making activity got kind of turned upside down in various ways. Um, and if it reached a kind of fever pitch with Ultra Visitor. Yeah. Um, and I was saying this very same point in an interview yesterday that, that a, a few of the tunes on Ultra Visitor are more or less like the, the longest time I've ever spent on an individual piece of music. I, I think go, uh, 50 Cycles took me about a month to do. And I, I mean, I, I don't really relish spending that much time. You know, I like to work fast. I like to make decisions fast. I don't dwell on things. I just get on with it and crack on and, and put as much energy is into it as I can because energy kind of gets soaked up I think by deliberating too much so I'm, I'm all about speed when I'm making music mm. um, but still that piece in the end took an enormous amount of time you know comparatively speaking for me so 
after that, it, it felt like time to let the pendulum drift off somewhere else. And it eventually drifted off into what uh, ended up called, being called the solo bass, solo, solo electric bass yeah. stuff, which was just literally me with a bass guitar and an amplifier. There was no uh, electronic assistance of any kind. Uh, but the part, part of the transition to that point was was Hello Everything, where I was kind of winding back from that brutal intensity, not just sonically, but be, but the associated kind of intensity of the programming. It's just time to move the focus into something that I, I suppose I would sort of just very, very, very quickly to summarise it as something where, where the, the, the mel melody has focus. Mm. Right, whereas this... Of this story and, and a lot before it was was like uh, like a rhythm section on whatever drugs you can think of times whatever the biggest number you can think of turned upside down round upside down again and just an enormous melting pot of chaos and uh, I was actually trying to I mean in ways I was trying to sort of discover whether non-repetitive rhythmic driven music could be catchy you know whether you can have a, a something you know like a pop song that gets stuck in your head this kind of earworm they call it you know like this thing you just can't even forget about even if you don't like it i was just trying to see if you could do that with drums or like you know like a like a kind of an inferno of music i mean i don't you know again it's for people like yourself to make judgment on that i'm not going to tell you where i succeed anyway the point is that, that, that this pendulum this is I'm trying to describe this way that the pendulum was swinging and it swung eventually right out to the other side where I was just playing a bass guitar and I didn't want to even see a studio. I didn't want to sort of see a synth. Yeah. It was like, it was, it was a, in a different way. I was trying to make a different way of life for myself basically because, and so, but, but sorry, yeah, just no, no, I, 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 th I think, I think you put, you know, it all really, uh, well and in simple terms for, you know, anybody who's familiar with your discography and anybody who's not, I encourage you to kind of, dive in and you know sort of see how you have kind of swung from one space to another um you know but i, I guess uh, as, as an electronic musician and as somebody who's constantly working with music hardware music technology um sometimes even you know making your own from scratch um you know what what, what do you think of i guess this current trend in development that i see a lot of producers talking about where uh, through new developments in hardware and midi and software it seems almost as if you know, maybe at some point this pendulum swing, swing that you're talking about could almost be like eliminated from the meta as, you know, sort of live instrumentation, electronic instrumentation, almost become one and the same. Because it seems right. like with each new technological development, the intention is to make the process of creating and composing, you know, through these mediums so easy. It's as simple as picking mm. up a bass guitar and just blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I mean... I'm not keeping tabs on every single new development. So I'm going to just go with what you said there. I mean, I'm interpreting that as uh, what I kind of broadly think I'm seeing that uh, it's that the, the ways in which software uh, seems to be developed, seems to be continually uh, taking away uh, ugly, uh, brute, uh, you might say, sort of silent data, like streams of numbers or whatever it might be. Because, you know, in the end, actually, that's what all of this boils down to. If you're talking about a, a digital interface for creating sound, you know, you, you're starting with pretty pictures, but you're always ending up with ones and noughts. And it's, it seems to me to be removing the stages in between so you, that you can kind of just have this intuitive interface and you go, you know, you go straight through to the output. And uh, look, I, I think it's, it's would be a crass oversimplification to kind of make a value judgment on it, whether this is good, whether this is positive, whether this is not, you know, it's going to open the doors up to people who, don't necessarily have that disposition for technical uh, stuff. Uh, I mean, because, you know, rewinding back to the kind of earlier days of electronic music, I mean, you would it would just simply be necessary mm. you, to, for you to have an affinity for this kind of activity 
to actually really accomplish music in that way. I mean, it was, it was, you know, I suppose it varies somewhat on context, mm. but really it would be a massive advantage if, if you did have that disposition for, for technical uh, modes of thinking and being able to look at things in a sort of abstract and perhaps mathematical way. Mm. I mean, certainly going right back to the early days, you know, pre mass market synthesizers, you know, going back into the, the 70s and 60s, you know, this, this was so hard that you would have to have, you would have to be extremely intrepid. You also have to have a massive budget, actually, as well, yeah. which is a great, again, one of the great things about now yeah, true. is that, that those, those barriers to entry are completely removed. Because, I mean, I found that so hard because I didn't know any money as a kid. I wanted to do stuff, but I just didn't have the means to acquire any equipment yeah. and any kid now with a laptop, I mean, can just dial straight. And I, I think that's, you know, really that, that, that whatever other considerations come into play, this is so valuable, I think, like to allow people that, that route. And, and they can, if, if they want to stick with the stuff that where a lot of presets are being used or a lot of the hard work or a lot of the number crunching, so to speak, is being done for them, that's fine. And if they feel that the need to explore, then you can keep you can keep going. You can you can go deep as you want. You know, it's it's it's, it's actually what it is 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 it's open on so many different levels mm -hmm. to people with different dispositions, different and different strengths. No, it's true. And, and so that, I mean, I can't. That's ultimately a good thing. You know, the, the only uh, yeah the, I mean, the only disadvantage that I can see for like from an outsider perspective, and I don't know if this is ever something that you know you suffer from in your own creative process, is I guess the ease of use and alteration and access to so many different things, be it VSTs, programs, DAWs, whatever it is, uh, yeah. for a lot of creators, when they sit down and make something, uh, almost makes mm. for them a, a situation of option paralysis where you're sitting down yeah. to make music yeah. and you intend to compose yeah, something. Yeah. And instead of doing that, you're just like scrolling through snares for two hours. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? I know, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. No, it, I completely get that. I mean, I think... It's a perhaps, you know, one, one situation, you know, will always have its, have, have its pitfalls. And, and yeah, you know, I think you're very, you know, much, you know, bang on with that particular pitfall you've identified. It, it can become a rabbit hole of suddenly you've gone from the options being so limited, you're kind of constrained and that can be an advantage because it, it rules out whole areas of decision making and suddenly you've got you can con con control everything. And I mean, I, I, I know this very problem myself, but I have, I believe recognized it where it, where it's cropping up. And I, I'm just really harsh. I just say, look, actually, I don't care. I'm just going to, if, if, if there's that many sounds, I'm just going to just more or less be arbitrary because I'll pick one sound and okay, that it might not be in some sort of, uh, kind of categorical sense the best sound but you've got a sound and that then is allowing you to keep moving and make the next decision and then at some point later on it's like actually that sound kind of sucks so you just change it but like initially just just pulling something out thinner i mean really like if anyone is doing getting stuck in that thing you're talking about i would just say just use anything because in the end you just need to get the, the for me i don't know maybe it's it's different for other people but for me the whole thing stands or falls on the basis of momentum mm. you know like this momentum of keeping your thoughts fluid keeping the enthusiasm there keeping things moving so it's developing in front of your eyes rather than this kind of fossilized kind of thing you're like chipping away at over the years you know it's just it just all the it's harder and harder for the enthusiasm and the love to stay present and it becomes like a just a like a an obligation or a task or something that Really, in the end, you know, you've got no interest in. So, no, that's that's uh, a good point. Just make a choice. Make a choice. You know, pick something. No, that's a good point, especially on a lot of these programs. Any sound that you're throwing in there can be easily swapped out for something later. Exactly. That's it. You just make a choice, and you know, because the thing is, once you've got the ideas actually rolling, mm -hmm. then you can start to make a bit better choice anyway. Because if you don't really, if you're trying to make music from, you know as it were, the sort of first principles of of getting the sounds right before you actually know what the composition is going to be. You're sort of, I think, putting the putting the, uh, the the cart before the horse, you know. Like, you know, it's actually that. I mean, and this is again, it's one of the things I take time and time again from being an instrumental player. Is like, you know what? 
get the melody, get the thing that, that actually makes this piece, gives it its identity, and then build. You know, that's not the only way to do it. You can start anywhere you want. But that is, for me, time and time again, you know, you start with that line and you maybe write it out, you know, for the whole piece. And then you just build from it, you know, let it, let it spiral in it. And it tells you what to do. You, you, I mean, for me, it's like the decisions are made, you know, it's just automatic. Mm. Um, you've spoken in past interviews and contexts about uh, music and the music that you make and develop, not being all in everything that you do. Um, to not get too personal or anything like that, what are those hobbies or activities you often find yourself coming back to in order to give yourself perspective, you know, kind of outside of the music world and reset your head and give yourself an opportunity to kind yeah. of breathe outside of it and come back to it and do what you got to do? I mean, speaking to people is, is a good one. That's true. You know, like, <laughs> but that, but that, but I mean, that comes it's... hard during the pandemic. Oh, man. I mean, you know, I mean, in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously satirizing myself here a little bit because I'm sure many people see me as a hermit and they'd be, you know, kind of correct. I've been self-isolating for 25 years, you know, like it's, it's kind of not that new to me, this stuff. But, you know, I, I'm actually more or less serious, you know, like this is, this is it's kind of a big thing, you know, and, and to just hang out with people who are not, kind of really particularly interested in my work, you know, and talk about things beyond it. You know, it's, it, I have to have that. I have to have that way of swinging out to make it feel, I think it actually makes it still feel special. Hmm. You know, having a life continually sort of saturated with it is, is, you know, I'm always looking for ways to kind of keep the enthusiasm that, that without that, there's nothing. Hmm. So it can be as simple as just, yeah, just hanging out and, but, you know, not, like to talk about tunes, you know, just, just hanging out to hang out. But I mean, I'm a, I'm a big one for, I mean, especially, you know, especially as I've got older, I mean, I used to love a lot of cycling, got a bit dangerous, you know, a kind of couple of slightly sort of hair raising incidents, you know, with, with crazy drivers, you know, coming towards me on the wrong side of the road and stuff. So I kind of switched over to, to running. But uh, running you can do anywhere. I, I, I love a good run. You know, I mean, it, it just... <laughs> yes, please, do, please you know, stay you, safe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I've got that locked in. Uh, uh, yeah, but it's... Yeah, I mean, the, the running, I mean, like, I just... I mean, when you're on the road, it doesn't matter. You know, you just stick, you know, you, you run your shoes and your kit, run out the hotel door, mm. you explore the local area. It's perfect, mm. you know. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big reader, so, you know, the, there's... But it's, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's a web of stuff because mm. there's things on the periphery of my work. You know, the, the programming side is not always at the centre. It's, it's, it's a, kind of a peripheral interest. It's the things at the centre, you know, and probably the most abiding thing is harmony. Mm. And that's because I think harmony is the big one. But harmony is the one. I believe, you know, this is the toughest nut to crack. I sure, I'm sure there's going to be sophisticated AI that will, will do very impressive uh, attempts, you know, harmonization, counterpoint, you know, all this stuff, you know, it won't be outside the reach of software. But I do think that this is, you know, the, the last, this is the last and the strongest, uh, if you like, degree of freedom. Because as you say, like like instrumental, it's kind of like, it's not like playing an instrument is superfluous. People still love to see that stuff and hear it, but it's it's not it's not necessary by any means. I mean, and you know, like in the eighties where people saw electronic music as kind of sort of an inferior, a lot of musicians at least did, you know, this kind of substandard or like kind of plastic sort of cheap version of music. I mean, all that's gone. No one thinks about that. No one cares about that, which is great. You know, that's how it should be. But, um, but it is easier. I mean, I'm going to say that. I mean, I, I don't think that's that controversial. I mean, like, really, you know, you need to spend years with an instrument to make it worth anyone's while to hear you do what you do. Mm. And you can you can get great. You can get straight into software. You know, if you have got ideas, you can get straight in. The harmony is is. I mean, this for me anyway. This is the big one. 
because this this is the stuff that where the where the the deepest thought I believe has gone in, in instrument music, and it's the stuff I still find truly uncanny. Mm. So you know, just to kind of put a pin in it. I mean, it's like you feel like at least in your own creation, when you're coming up with some of the most exciting ideas or the things that are really thrilling you, it's just simply through this layering of kind of the 12 notes that we're familiar with in the chromatic scale, maybe some, you know, interplay between those notes, semitones, something like that. I don't know. But uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, look, you know, of course, as we said earlier, because of this, there can always be slippage between different areas so i'm using you know i have to also say i'm using this term in, in this loose and kind of qualified manner but but um it it seems to me that this is this is the thing which continually fascinates me and that i i i feel that the the, the depth is it within the scale of a human life you you can't you can't really get close to, to covering mm. that domain in, in, with, with any sense of, of uh, your endeavor being complete. Okay. You know, it's 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 really where where things reach off so far away into the distance. You know, but it's 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 uh, yeah, kind of. I find it's the most uncanny zone. Mm. Uh, just to throw a few at you from the uh, chat and from the fans before we uh, let you go. I uh, just wanted to know, uh, quite a few people are asking, uh, including uh, Wake Up to find out if there are any more uh, plans to do future Showbelieder 1, Show 1 stuff. Uh, that was kind of an era that excited a lot of fans. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it'll be fun. I mean, so, I mean, this, I know this is a non-answer, mm. and I, I'm not deliberately just equivocating, but um, it, it uh, it's really hard to like know what's going to happen next week right now. So planning, getting people in the same room, and, and things like this feels a little bit distant for me. You know, I'm not I'm not I'm not kind of uh, banking on any actual kind of plans coming together right now because things have just changed with the pandemic. Things are changing every day. Mm. But yeah, I mean, the time will come. Let's put it like that. It's, it's got to happen. You know, I've got, I've got, I've got an idea for, for the next um, iteration of that band. I, I want to do something quite different with it. I'm not going to go out uh, with anything approximating the first show that we did, okay. which is kind of enshrined in that record or that lair track. You know, I mean, it was, it was. You know that was a live show basically that the album was a live album we didn't we didn't market it as a, as a live record but that's what it was but yeah yeah oh yeah it's uh it's in the pipeline you know, speaking of the um uh you know the live thing uh just to get a quick answer on this was was there any sort of like ethos or philosophy to deciding that uh you know the the solo one record would be sort of in a live setting as opposed to you know just kind of like recording it just simple in the studio just you know quiet on your own do you mean the solo bass? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so you're, you're you're asking me whether it was intended, whether my original idea was for it to be become a live yeah, record. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't know. What what I did is I just made various recordings as I went through the process of um, rehearsing the pieces, mm -hmm. and then I went on to you know I was obviously partly rehearsing the pieces to then go and play them at shows. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I recorded the shows as well. And when I, when I got the recordings back from the shows, I mean, you know, there is that, there is that sort of slightly kind of feverish kind of mania in, in the live recording that simply isn't something that happens in the studio. Everything is a lot more controlled, sedate. In a way, is it, you know, the, 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 the recordings I made in the studio were, um, if you like, sort of more uh, clear articulations of the pieces, but but the the life just had this energy, mm. and for whatever other shortcomings it had, I mean, I just felt that in the end that was the best. It, that was that was what rep represented that uh, set of music 
uh, most satisfactorily to me. Um, but yeah, I have a, yeah. another one from Fisar before we let you go. Um, he's asking about the record Go Plastic, which uh, you were referring earlier oh, yeah. in the interview to things being and sounding plastic. And, and I'm personally aware of kind of the mm -hmm. structural, you know, concept that you had going into that record, kind of avoiding a lot of repetition and stuff. But um, right. uh, he wants to know what exactly, like philosophically speaking, does going plastic, you know, mean for you? Is it something akin to what you were referring to earlier or is it something else? That's quite a good one. It's a good question. I mean, so look, I mean, it, but but the basis of it is is actually very mundane. Mm. Uh, so I don't know who made this piece, but uh, back in 1989, I had a radio tape uh, from a hip hop DJ in this country. And uh, I mean, sadly, the tape is long lost. Mm. So I don't know. I still don't know really what this what this track is. But anyway, there was and there was this kind of like phase in 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 british hip-hop where everything was really fast it was like 130 bpm kind of rapping and it was you know this thing was 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 pretty fun music anyway there was a track on there and i interpreted the lyric in the chorus as don't go plastic that's how i heard it right <laughs> and uh years later it dawned on me it's like actually he's probably saying dope on plastic but i don't know I guess that kind of makes more sense in hip hop world than than don't go plastic. But I was at this don't go plastic thing was like that's such a weird sentence. Or like a kind of uh, you know this sort of <laughs> demand, you know, being made of you. Don't do that. Don't go plastic. You know, so and I just you know, and then but it always had this kind of relationship with you know, with with yeah, the different methods of making music and their stereotypes associated with them and I thought actually what I wanted to do was was kind of the opposite. So I, you may know, like, actually, Don't Go Plastic for me was first used as a, as a track title on an album called uh, Music Who's Rotted One. Yeah. But I just pulled it out, like, of the blue. It didn't really kind of relate to the tune. It was just like, oh, that's a good title for that track. Fuck it, you know. Um, but then when, when Go Plastic came along, I was, I was kind of thinking through titles. And... One, one strand of, of my thinking at the time on that record was just to get as synthetic as possible, mm. to get, you know, like if you imagine this, this pendulum, yeah. thing, this pendulum analogy, it's, I guess, probably as about as far as uh, away from the solo bass type yeah. end of the spectrum. This is like, there's no there's not even a suggestion of live. Mm. There's no, there's not even a hint of it. The whole point is, is, is to thrive um, within this entirely artificial realm. Mm. So it was, it was basically, you know, a sort of statement that felt like it resonated with, with that sentence and with, the, with that sentence sentiment behind it. Got it. And to uh, finally kill like 12 birds with one stone, uh, I've gotten quite a few yeah. questions about whether or not there's any interest on your part in sort of reissuing, re-releasing some of like the pre-Feed Me Weird things like EPs, releases, work, anything like that. Because uh, uh, some of those have been out in some capacity at some point, and there are some people who are very curious about some of those recordings. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, there there have been some conversations. I mean, I mean, I mean, some of it, I've got to be, I've got to be honest. Like, it doesn't fill me with joy to do that. I, I quite like sometimes when music just vanishes, mm -hmm. and 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 actually, we, we we now live in a situation where it's very, very, very hard. Where it never it goes back. away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and and this is, I mean, I think speak especially in conversations I've had with a lot of jazz musicians. You know, people are really kind of it really bugs them because you'll go to a you go you'll do a gig and you you just want to use the gig like a like a comedian might you know to try out material you know and work it up and experiment right. but then it gets filmed and then it goes online and then it can't be removed and it gets taken as a representation of your work and it actually is like well I didn't really know what I was doing. I was taking risks. I didn't know whether it was going to work and maybe it didn't work. Uh so this is 
Okay, so that's the extreme. Right. And, and a certain you idea know, that, that, that you're employing, you might want to be fresh to a new crowd every time that you do it. Right, right. You know, there, there's there's so many different ramifications of this this kind of tendency to immortalize every moment. But so so I kind of cherish stuff that that feels transient or, or feels that it actually has no real place anymore that it's not relevant i mean you know i don't i don't mean to be dismissive i, I think it's a really good question and i appreciate where it's coming from no i don't think it's dismissive my, at all i think even in this younger generation there is like almost a thirst for that to a degree because there are a lot of younger sure. millennials and zoomers who i see getting into tapes and there are entire sure, yeah. cassette only labels based off of like Bandcamp, where you can't even preview every song. Right. And if you want to hear the whole thing, you have to right. get the tape. And, you know, it's about kind of Big creating song. almost that shadow area where something can be enjoyed in kind of a private place. Right. So, yeah. So, I mean, these 12 inches for me, like them just basically vanishing and there's just only a few copies in private collections and that's it. You know, it's it kind of, I don't, I don't mind that. You know, it, it, it it's it's the opposite. I find probably more at odds with my mentality because it, it's if if you imagine, not that I claim to always succeed, but if if I'm always trying to move ahead, the more baggage you've got kind of behind you is it 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 doesn't always feel like it's it's making that process of moving ahead uh, any easier. And not just because it's I'm aware of it, but because the crowd is as well. The audience is actually also aware of this kind of history. So, you, you, you know, I fantasize about a clean slate. I can never have that. But, you know, th this, this history of music is also informing, you know, in whatever different ways, of course, they're very varied. But, but nonetheless, it's, it's informing a kind of a, a narrative about, uh, about a musician. And, and to that extent, to some extent, it's, it's, it can inform expectations. So you kind of, I don't really want to look back because it just reminds me of this stuff that I'm kind of trapped by, you know, I can't escape it. I know I can't, but I don't want to dwell on it. So if a record vanishes from the planet Earth, I mean, I'm not the first person to want to bring it back. And like, like stereotype, my first record, I mean, it was a complete failure. It was a complete, like, commercial disaster. Like, I, I remember being at home when the, when the distributor van uh, turned up and brought brought me back half the records. They couldn't sell it, mm. you know. And, and okay, that that's what the world made of it. I, I, I feel like that's that's okay, you know. I don't, I don't want to train. I don't want to. I want to sort of drag everyone back to that and go. Hey, you know, you need to understand this. No, I, right. I if, if 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 you wanted it, you should have been there the first time. <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't want to be, I'm not being hard. No, I, it, I, I, I know, I know. Cares. That's, that's my personal commentary. That's my personal commentary. That's my <laughs> commentary. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, you've given us a, a lot of your time and a lot of insight into this record and, and beyond. And we appreciate you uh, taking time out of your day to do this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Right. Have a good one.